Matt Lohmeyer, such a pleasure to have you on American Thought Leaders. Jan, thanks for having me on. I'm happy to be here. So, Matt, tell me, what are you seeing in the military? Let me say up front that uh, these are my opinions and I don't speak for the Defense Department. What I've been seeing in the military during uh, the past year specifically has been uh, what I'll call the hyper-politicization of our military forces uh, in our diversity, equity, and inclusion trainings. And I've recognized uh, in those trainings both the vocabulary uh, and the narratives of the Marxist revolutionary impulse is what I'll call it. And uh, I'm also seeing a double standard at play. Um, and what I mean by that is that it seems that people are allowed to, service members are allowed to advocate for the revolutionary agenda, narrative and cause, but to either disagree with talking points or ideas or to point out the partisanship is to have a finger wag back at you and to be accused of being politically partisan. Our service members are trained that they're, they're supposed to be apolitical and for good reason. And yet every aspect of their lives at the moment is becoming politicized. I spoke up and said, we need to remove the politics from our military environment. And I was uh, relieved of my command for being politically partisan. And so where does that leave our young service members right now who, uh, who are supposed to be apolitical, but yet want to retain their beliefs, values, and be able to speak freely? Almost three months ago, you were relieved of your command in the Space Force after you wrote your book, Irresistible Revolution. And so it, I guess before we start, before we talk about the book, which I've really enjoyed reading, um, where are things now for you? Yeah, first I'll say up front, I am still active duty, though I'm on terminal leave. And terminal leave means uh, I'm separating from the service and my last day in the service is 1 September. Where things stand for us at the moment is that for the past three months, um, we've heard that there was an alleged investigation that was ongoing in the Pentagon, but I've not had any communication about that, either from my chain of command or from the Air Force Inspector General's office, who is the one that I think was to be conducting an investigation. Uh, and so I wrote a letter to then acting secretary of the Air Force, explaining certain circumstances, which, which I don't plan to make public, uh, but also um, requesting an early retirement and a separation honorably from the service. And uh, they've denied me an early retirement, but agreed that they would separate me. And so my family and I have decided that that's the best course of action for us right now, given the circumstances. I've sometimes, whether you want to call it tongue in cheek or not, uh, just said I've been, I was fired or you've seen it show up in that way. Uh, and some people had presumed that that meant I was no longer in the service um, or that I'd been kicked out of the military. And that wasn't true either. So I was in command of a space based missile warning unit um, in Colorado. And uh, at the time that I published the book and spoke about it publicly on a podcast, my chain of command deemed my behavior politically partisan in nature. And that was the allegation at the time that I was relieved of my command of the space-based missile warning unit. Now, I was still uh, a, a lieutenant colonel on active duty in the Space Force from that day on. But the day that I was relieved of command on the phone, the general officer who had relieved me of command asserted that it was because I was politically partisan while acting in an official capacity, which I've always denied that I was relieved of command. And then the investigation was open to determine whether or not I was actually politically partisan while acting in an official capacity, which seems ironic uh, because perhaps it is. And so I never did hear an outcome uh, from that uh, investigation. And I read in the news, uh, whether it was several days later or a week later, that that investigation had been stood down by the Department of the Air Force and that the Department of the Air Force's Inspector General Office uh, the highest level in the complaints office in the uh, Department of the Air Force had opened their own investigation to in, into these issues or these matters. And it was about that vague. And so whether it was me or a whole host of people that were a part of that investigation, I just can't pretend to say, and I still don't know and haven't heard. But um, 
in case there are some viewers or listeners that would be quick to think that it, I'm just some disgruntled service member who decided this was my issue I was going to pick a fight over, um, they'd be wrong. I had attempted before ever writing a book to use my chain of command and the me the internal mechanisms available to every service member for these kinds of complaints for many months before I ever put pen to paper and began writing what became Irresistible Revolution. Uh, I had used every member of my chain of command, in fact, to the very top. I'd had uh, both in-person and phone conversations with them about some of what I was seeing, expressing my concern that it was dividing our force. And then I filed a formal inspector general's office complaint uh, in writing a seven page uh, memo that happened to go to the same three star general that ended up later relieving me of my command duties. Uh, and they sat on that through the election cycle in November, December and January, waiting for an outcome, it seemed to me, before they made an adjudication of my own complaint about the teaching of critical race theory at my base, which was in direct contravention of President Trump's executive order at the time banning such trainings in federal agencies. And so I felt nearly no other option other than to write a book and discuss the issues publicly so that we could uh, invite many people into the discussion. So you mentioned diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, being uh, you know, a theme that's uh, taught extensively in the military now. Um, this doesn't seem to many to be problematic and seems, in fact, to be quite laudable. What's the issue with this? It can seem like a laudable goal. The issue, I think, was well stated by Carol Swain, who uh, recently and several times has said that the diversity, equity and inclusion industry is steeped in critical race theory, which is rooted in Marxist ideology. And that's 100 percent correct. The trouble with that is Marxist ideology uh, and a particular aspect of Marxist ideology that I focus on uh, in both my writings and in understanding this issue is the oppressor versus the oppressed narrative that is developed by Marx and Engels in their 1848 Communist Manifesto. When you start to lump people either into economic class stratifications or into race identity groups and insist that one group by virtue of their identity is, is inherently an oppressor, and in our race dialogue discussions, that is the white group. And in, uh, in another group, based on their racial identity, is an oppressed and victimized group of people. Then you start to breed division and animosity among and between those groups of people and breed distrust. Now, critical race theory does exactly what I've just described. It has capitalized on race essentialism and race division in our dialogue and redefine terms that that are a large part of the diversity, equity and inclusion industry and their redefined terms and vocabulary are now showing up in our military training sessions. Instead of unifying people and helping us solve some of the problems or issues we're currently facing, it actually plants new ones and it causes greater division. And um, I've seen that uh, as an active duty service member. I've seen it as a commander. Uh, in our in our armed forces. I wonder if you could just give me some examples of, uh, you know, what you've seen, how this is more broadly changing, how the military is operating in your view. A few examples of what I've seen in the past year. When I showed up in command in Colorado, it was shortly in the aftermath of George Floyd's death. And the Black Lives Matter movement was actively crafting a narrative that was proliferating throughout Western society. It had been around since at least, I think, 2013. But in 2020, they were wildly successful at, at capitalizing on an anti-American narrative. Um, many of the themes that you saw showing up in these anti-American narratives were also used in projects like the New York Times 1619 project the narratives that you see showing up from groups like that began to infiltrate U.S. military bases in our diversity, equity and inclusion trainings that we were not just having maybe semi-annually 
as we occasionally have trainings, other trainings like um, sexual harassment and sexual assault prevention trainings and suicide prevention trainings. Those have been around in the military for a very long time. These diversity or race discussion down days that we were having, and I'll specifically speak to my base, were happening frequently now all of a sudden. And we were being shown videos that I would call propaganda videos that demonized the Constitution of the United States. You shouldn't be allowed to serve in uniform if you're going to, from your official position, push out anti-American, anti-Constitution videos to the people at your base and say that they should watch them in preparation for a down day where we were going to discuss race. I participated in a reading club that was advocated for by base leadership in which we read a book by Igeoma Oluo called So You Want to Talk About Race, in which not only was the United States, its founders and its founding documents demonized, but the discussion guide in the back of the book encouraged the, the, whoever was going to facilitate the discussion to make sure that if white people want to center their feelings, they separate themselves from the group and go find other white people to center their feelings so that people of color do not have to share their burdens. The book also recommended which organizations they should be donating their excess money to if they weren't sure who to give donations to, what type of political candidates they should be supporting and what issues they should be voting for. I mean, it's exceptionally partisan. I point out in a formal complaint that these things are going on and it's dismissed. I write a book about these things going on and I'm fired from my command position for being politically partisan. And I want to make that point really clear too, because yeah, you can say I'm partisan for taking an opposing stand in my own personal values, but the whole reason this came up is because I was trying to get rid of the partisanship from our active duty military service uh, organizations. That doesn't belong in the military. Our young people don't want to have this stuff jammed down their throats. And and as it was, and it was showing up often, to bring it up was to be labeled politically partisan. And so where does that leave? you know, a good chunk of your service members in uniform who don't want politics in the workplace, are they allowed to speak up and say, hey, I, I identify that as offensive and politically partisan. And so I was seeing things like that. I had a young female come into my office as a result of these trainings that we were having on the base uh, and, and say that she had never been raised to believe that she was an outsider in this country, but because of the trainings that she was receiving from the base and from the chaplain, the chaplain, political trainings, race trainings. She had learned that she was an outsider, not just in her own country, but in the, in the military and in uniform. That's false. No one's an outsider in the military because of the race, but we're teaching people to start thinking that way. And so when I start seeing that as a commander in charge of young people and have, who has a stewardship for their well-being, and a mission to accomplish that has no place in my organization. And to bring that up my chain of command and to see no real attention paid to those issues, it, it necessitated making the discourse go public. There's a reason people trust our military. It's because, historically speaking, we're not uh, politicized.